Well, I'm J.W. Biava with Immunolytics. Uh, just going to go over some of the basics of mold. I'm sure a lot of you will, will know a bunch of this information, but I want to make sure we have the same foundation uh, to kind of give you an idea of what could be going on within your residence, your business, or of course those of your patient. So here I like to start with this picture because this is from my own house. Uh, this is actually a pipe that was put into my house and the plumber never glued the pipe together at this fitting. So it slowly dripped over time and grew stachybotrys everywhere. Uh, I knew there was a problem because I monitor my home, but it was very difficult to find. So I show this to say even those of us in the industry can actually have these problems. All right, so moving on to the mold basics. Mold is any of a variety of single-celled fungi that degrade organic material. Excuse me one second. Mold eats by sending out root-like structures into a food source and sucks up what it needs. We call mold nature's little garbage disposal. Without mold, we'd have mounds of trash everywhere. So it is very important within our environment uh, but it is very hazardous if the amplification of growth continues in our breathing environment. Mold reproduces by sending out spores, which are like seeds that are found naturally in the air. They are ubiqu ubiquitous. They are everywhere uh, within this world. Mold spores themselves number more than the grains of pollen, and mold does not have a limited season. Mold is found in most homes, a lot of times in bathrooms, on old food, uh, whether it's fruits or vegetables, within carpets, drapes, bedding, AC ducts, in basements, on clothing, shoes, etc. And the spores, uh, they typically range in the size of 1 to 20 microns. Uh, to give you kind of a comparison, a human hair is about 100 microns in diameter. And so they're very, very small. They get airborne and they stay in the air for a while. To the right here, you'll see this is actually a picture of stachybotrys spores under a microscope at 100x magnification. So this line represents 10 microns, and you can see how small these little spores are. And of course, the spores, they carry the mycotoxins on their surface. So when you inhale the spores, you're inhaling this, the actual toxins as well. There are currently about 100,000 described species of fungi between the moles, the mushrooms, and the yeast. But only a few of these 100,000 uh, are commonly associated with indoor air quality problems. More than 10,000 mold spores can fit onto the head of a pin. So when you see a spot of mold growth on a wall or any type of surface, you know that could be billions or trillions of spores. So to disturb that mold growth would actually get all those spores airborne, and that's where the exposure primarily comes from. The majority of these mold spores are, like we said, between 1 and 20 microns in size. So very small, very easy to get up into the air, just like dust. So I tell people a lot of times, imagine mold travels a lot like dust. And if you have dust, imagine that's kind of, uh, that could be mold, and that could uh, uh, represent how the mold's traveling, where it's collecting. So dust is a good representation of mold as far as traveling through our air. Let's see. We look at the top seven common toxic molds. So these are the molds that we most frequently see associated with indoor air quality problems that are toxic. Of course, stachybotrys, it's the one that gets all the press. That's the toxic black mold, as it's called. Aspergillus, which is very common. Penicillium, also very common. We do see a lot of cladosporum, although I wouldn't say as many health effects come from the cladosporum. It is very common. Then Ultranaria, Bipolaris, and then yeast. Uh, we, most yeast is grouped into Candida. When we report it, there is uh, Rhodotrula separate, but the yeast is, is very often a very large problem. So mold itself really only needs four things to grow. It needs air, a food source, a surface on which to, to live and grow, and then moisture. So if it has if it has these four things, it's going to start to grow. The only thing that we can really control is moisture. So if you hear me say one thing today, and I should probably say it a few times, there's no moisture, there's no mold. That's the key. It's the one thing you can control to prevent mold growth. So no moisture, no mold. 
As far as the life cycle of mold itself, it develops from these microscopic seed-like structures, which we call spores. And the spores, as we said, they're ubiquitous. They're everywhere in the environment, throughout the world. These spores will settle on a food source, which is any organic material. Uh, it specifically likes building materials, especially like the drywall backing, because that cardboard is it's, it's like candy for mold. It's ground up food. And of course, the wood framing. Um, that's wonderful organic material for, for mold to, to eat. These spores, um, when water comes in contact with them, whether it's standing water or high humidity, they swell to two to three times their normal size. And then the growth uh, then includes these thread-like structures, which we call hyphae, that become a mycelium mass. The mycelium mass is really where you start to see the mold grow visually. So you develop the mycelium mass, the hyphal, the, the hyphae or hyphal fragments as, as they get into the air. The hyphae produce the spores, and those spores then are the primary source of the airborne contamination. We look at a, a typical building envelope, so your residence or your business, whatever it may be, there are four primary routes of liquid to enter that building. That's, of course, liquid flow, um, whether it's flooding uh, or just water intruding through the exterior walls. Uh, capillary suction, water actually getting sucked up into the building materials. Air movement and vapor diffusion. So this, again, can be just humidity that's traveling through the air. If that humidity gets above, well, 60% or above, that mold will actively grow without any standing water. So again, the control of the moisture, control of the water is the key. There's no moisture, there's no mold. Now the moisture sources that often result in mold growth within buildings, these are the, the common ones that we see in, in inspections, and I, I think Jeff will be able to confirm this. Leaking roof systems, especially here in New Mexico, people say, well, you live in the desert, there shouldn't be mold. But we have a lot of flat roofs. So we see a lot of roof leaks and a lot of mold growing in that ceiling space between the drywall and the actual roof system. Of course, flooding. Flooding is a little more rare around here, but it does occur. Pipe leaks, um, whether that's like mine where it wasn't glued properly, wasn't installed properly, or over time as the, the pipe degrades and there may be pinhole leaks in copper piping or a screw that goes through uh, uh, a pipe or something like that. Bursting pipes, of course, in the wintertime, if they freeze and burst, source of moisture. And one that's often overlooked are the overflowing sinks, wash machines, and toilets. So we may have an event in which something overflows and we mop it up. We don't really consider whether or not the drywall has been properly dried or any wood, um, other building materials, that carpeting that, that could grow the mold. And then again, the high humidity, 60% or above, will allow mold growth. Plants with standing water, if we actually have plants within indoor environments and they, the soil stays wet for too long, it will grow mold and that mold will become airborne. And humidifiers, especially whole house humidification systems, if they're not cleaned properly or if you have localized humidity that gets to 60% or above, then that will also cause mold growth. Now as far as the indoor air quality goes, EPA has come out and said, well, Americans spend about 90% or more of their time indoors, and the levels of indoor pollutants can be two to five times higher than they are outdoors. And of course, sometimes it can be even as high as 100 times, especially if you don't use low VOC paint, uh, you bring in new furniture that's off-gassing. These all contribute to the indoor air quality problems. They also say that it's estimated 50 to 65% of homes contain some sort of mold problem. Now we say some sort of mold problem, it could be a, a moldy basement, it could be uh, a localized bathroom in which there was a uh, shower that wasn't properly closed and water seeps into the drywall, or it could be a whole house problem where the mold has been spread around through an HVAC system, running the AC or running the heaters. Now from the National Institute for Occupational Self uh, Safety and Health, which of course is NIOSH. The 70s and 80s, they, they did some studies and identified microorganisms 
as the primary source for indoor air contamination in about 5% of indoor air quality cases. So it was relatively low, and of course mold falls into those microorganisms. The same study uh, conducted in the 1990s identified microorganisms as the primary source of indoor air contamination in 35 to 50 percent, depending on the building type of indoor air quality cases. So you can see that the number of cases of microorganisms being the source of indoor air contamination went up by a factor of 10. So then, of course, the, the big question is what has changed? Well, we, we all know about the oil crisis back in 1973 when Carter was president. The Department of Energy was created with the purpose of consolidating energy policies. Based on the DOE policies, buildings were sealed up to conserve energy. This resulted in the trapping of contaminants due to reduced air exchanges. So to save on heating and save on cooling, the buildings were sealed up. When the buildings were sealed up, the air wasn't blowing through and it wasn't diluting down the contaminants. So we had higher contamination levels within our indoor environments. So these buildings were effectively turned into incubators when we're talking about the microorganisms. Because you have within a building the organic material, you have the mold spores. If you have the water, well then the sealing of the building produces a perfect incubation environment for mold to grow. So now we have something that we call sick building syndrome, or SBS. And sick building syndrome, it's really where the, the building occupants experience acute health and comfort effects that are linked to the time they spend in a building, but in which no specific illness or cause can be identified. And these complaints may be localized to a room or specific area within the building, or they may be widespread throughout the building. Of course, not everyone is affected in the same manner, and some may not be affected at all. Quite often, this results in some people being very sick and other people thinking that they're crazy or dismissing the symptoms or saying it's something else, something else that they're doing in their lives and not the building itself. Uh, sick building syndrome, they define it with these symptoms, difficult breathing, headaches, watering eyes, flu-like symptoms, and allergies. So the sick building syndrome we do see and often it will manifest itself or show itself in people who say that they are either sick when they go home or sick when they go to work. So someone may say, well, throughout the weekend I'm perfectly fine. I return to my job Monday morning and within two hours I have a headache or have difficulty breathing. So there's these signs that the building itself is in fact sick. So additional health concerns with mold besides the sick building syndrome, of course, as was mentioned before, mold does give off organic compounds called mycotoxins. And these compounds can cause neurological problems and are known carcinogens. So even if you aren't in the group of people who are affected by mold, uh, whether it's the sick building syndrome or some type of cognitive impairment or an allergy, well, the carcinogenic, carcinogenistic nature of the mold itself uh, is a problem for, for pretty much everyone, especially those with depressed immune systems. And mold may be infectious individuals with compromised immune systems. Uh, this is, I would say, well, it, it is important to know. So there are cases of aspergillosis or aspergillus infections in people which falls outside of the previous health symptoms listed. Now mycotoxins themselves, they poison tissues, or excuse me, they poison tissue, they do cause cancer, they can produce birth defects, and they reduce the immune system performance. Mycotoxins are some of the most carcinogenic naturally occurring compounds known. Uh, they have been compared to even the, the PCBs, which were banned back uh, in the 60s and 70s. And the fungi themselves produce hundreds of mycotoxins, including trichothecenes and ochratoxins. So these are classifications of the mycotoxins which are very damaging to human health. When we talk about sources of mold, the biggest one, the one we're most concerned with because it causes the, uh, most, uh, the largest number of exposures is contaminated building materials. And contaminated building materials will include your, your drywall, uh, any wood framing, and then organic materials such as carpeting and drapes could be even bedding. 
In addition to these contaminated building materials, as we said before, plants with standing water can contribute mold, decaying food if you leave fruit out on the counter too long and the mold starts to grow. Uh, pets can have mold in their, in their coats, so they can go outside, get the mold spores from the outside, and it will actually grow in their, in their coats. You go to pet the pets, and those mold spores are suspended, and you will actually inhale those. And one that's often overlooked are animal mounts. So those who hunt may have a big deer head, elk head, or whatever it may be on their wall, and the, the uh, mount itself can contain large amounts of mold. We talk about historical mold events. This is just kind of a side note, a uh, um, kind of point of interest. The Salem Witch Trials, it is, many people believe that those who were accused of being witches were actually just heavily exposed to toxins which caused the neurologic problems that made them behave the way they did. Of course, the, the great Irish potato famine in which the potato crops were wiped out by fungus. And then the one that's most interesting or, or most surprising is the curse of King Tut's tomb in which the curse was written above the tomb that whoever would enter the tomb would die. Many of the scientists who went in there to inspect the tomb actually did end up dying from aspergillosis. So the tomb itself was loaded with aspergillus spores that survived for thousands of years. This is kind of a typical growth sequence of mold. So this is what you may see if you have a water damaged structure. So the water moves in. If it's not dried out within 48 hours, the mold will start to grow. So 48 hours is kind of that magic number that you want to get all your building materials dry so that you don't see this growth sequence begin. And of course, the growth of mold is exponential from there. So after 48 hours, you're removing building materials because they are potentially contaminated. So it starts off with the most common molds, which would be the aspergillus, the penicillin, the cladosporum. They start to grow. And then over time, if the, if the moisture continues to exist or the leak persists, Alternaria and Bipolaris will start to grow. And then Catomium will come in and take over. And then eventually Stachybotrys, the, the toxic black mold. So often if we see Catomium, we know that Stachybotrys could be present or is close behind. Um, that's a point of interest because Catomium is much easier to get into the air and thereby be detected than Stachybotrys. Stachybotrys grows very slime-like and the spores don't get in, in the air as easily. This is kind of a, a fairly technical slide, but I, I'll point out a few things here that are very interesting. Is that if you were to model the rate that mold will fall out of the air, and just using the Stokes equations, um, you can see that the settling velocities for mold spores, uh, whether it's the penicillium, it takes about 58 minutes to fall one meter or three feet. The stachybotrys spores will fall out in about 15 minutes and the alternaria spores will fall out in about five minutes. So if you have something like a penicillium contamination, if penicillium is released into the air, it will stay in the air for almost an hour. And even stachybotrys, which doesn't get in the air quickly and falls out pretty quick, will still be in the air for 15 minutes. So disturbing mold spores, they will stay in the air. And of course, inhalation again, it's the primary route of exposure in indoor air quality. Now I want to do this, this is a very qualitative example to, to kind of hit home a point. And I'm going to do it with this building map. So this is a, a building that we had done, it was a department store where you had the entry. This is the counter which was the makeup, the perfumes, and the, the checkout counter. You had the men's dressing rooms on one side, the women's dressing rooms on another side, a warehouse area, a storage room. This was a maintenance closet, a kitchen or break room, and then the two bathrooms men's and women's. Well, if we take and model a, a, a typical mold growth using this kind of point source modeling, and of course this is very qualitative because a point source model is used for those things that radiate, so that would be like light or radiation, but it's still, if we view mold as being sent out by air currents, we'll, we'll kind of model it as it being radiated. So in this case, the concentration is inversely proportional to the square of the distance from the source. And again, it's not the best model, but I, it will hammer home the point. So if we look and say that in this men's bathroom here, there was a leaking toilet, and the leaking toilet produced mold growth. This mold growth then 
is sent out from that bathroom into the, the entire structure, the entire building. And so the further away we get from the source of the mold, obviously the lower the concentration is. So if we were to say that at the, at the source in the bathroom there were just 10 stachybotrys spores per cubic meter, at three meters away from that source, or about nine feet, you would expect to have proportionally about 11% of the stachybotrys spores detected. What that means is that if you're three meters or nine feet away from the source, you may not detect that stachybotrys contamination. So many of the remediators we work with, they will actually use a rule of thumb saying that you need to be within about nine feet of the mold source to be sure that you can detect it. Of course, if it's a large problem with a lot of spores, you're going to detect it many places within the building. But this just gives you an idea that if you were to have one area, one room of mold growth, you need to be pretty close to that room to assure that you can detect the mold spores. So what's that mean as far as taking the samples? So this is kind of what we call the patient sampling strategy. This is pretty obvious, but you want to sample in the areas in which you know or suspect that there has been moisture intrusion, whether that's from your roof leaks, your flooding, your pipe leaks, your overflowing toilets, um, whatever it may be. Sample in those areas. And then you want to sample in the areas in which you spend the most time, because the most time that you spend, the more likely you are to be exposed. That would be your bedroom, your living room, your kitchen, and then any occupied guest bedroom. So if you have children, you're going to want to sample their rooms as well. And then take as many samples as budget allows. It's always a balance between cost and information. So we realize that. Uh, we try and guide people on, on what areas we suggest that they sample to reduce the cost. But obviously, the more samples you have, the better the data, the better the information. And as far as the process of, of testing for mold, you contact us, whether you jump on our website or you call our laboratory. Uh, you order the testing materials, so the number of plates appropriate for the number of rooms or areas that you want to test. We ship those materials to you. You perform the one-hour sample collection. It's just exposing this Petri dish containing the Sabra dextrose auger for one hour. You then mail the samples back to our laboratory. And then once we receive them, within about five to seven days of sample or of receipt here at the laboratory, we will email you a report that details all the findings. This includes the various species, a count of the species, a total count, and a relative health scale to assess whether or not the mold levels could be adversely affecting your health. Once you receive that report, then we have the option of a free consultation in which we discuss with you the results, what we see, and any potential recommendations. The idea being we're not just going to tell you, hey, you have a mold problem, good luck. It's, hey, you have a mold problem, we've experienced it, and this is how it is often remediated, whether that's just changing out a, a filter on your, your AC or heating unit, running HEPA filtration to remove the contaminants, or actually having an, a remediation firm come in there and cut out the building materials that are contaminated. Uh, often we use the natural botanicals, the biobalance fogging. We, we recommend that for the reduction in the, the spore counts within the air. So we give you that consultation to try and help, help you out determining what to do next. All right, so with all that being said, uh, I do consider this a basic overview of the mold. There are always different situations within houses, within residences, buildings, wh whatever it may be. So hopefully you can take this information as a basis and then apply that to your situation. So this joke here, it's one of my favorite current jokes, is meant to hammer that home. There are only two types of people in the world, only two. Those who can extrapolate from incomplete information, and thank you, that's the end of my presentation.